Thank you, Barbara. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it's so good to see all your faces today. Gee, I'm going to just take a look at you here. Oh, that's great. This is great. As you uh, are aware, we're going to have a funeral for Cliff Harvison on Thursday at 11 a.m. I think when we sent out the email on Friday, there may have been a change, but just in case everybody wants to know, we're, we're going to have the funeral Thursday, the 18th at 11. Correct? All right, good. Also want to say thank you to uh, Tanya and to Judith Carlson. Yesterday, a fantastic thing happened. We had a wonderful wedding here. I wasn't a part of it. It was uh, Father Hines from St. Christopher, but it was a lovely wedding, and thank you for getting the chapel all set up and making it so conducive to, to couples who are who fell in love and uh, hey wow <laughs> I, I was wondering maybe you were going to do Wagner or something you know so all right anyway uh, so that's good um, also in May uh, May 22nd if, if save the date uh, Jack Fitzsimmons will have the Fitzgerald excuse me uh, Jack Fitzgerald will have his uh, memorial service as well at that day and then we have a car show coming up in a couple Saturdays, uh, the 4th, I believe it is. Keep an eye on your... Uh, and that should be fun. We had a car show last year. We had about 35 cars. Uh, someone told me last night, can't think of it, that we're going to have one of the cars from the Elliott Museum that's going to be here. So one of uh, Blake, uh, uh, Press Blake's Rolls Royces or something here. So maybe they'll let me drive it around. Huh? I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, we have a special presentation today and uh, to some special people. So Tony and Judith, if you'll join me up here as we make this special presentation. As you know, Judith is in charge of our green team. We call it the green team just because I couldn't think of a better idea and it uh, reminds me of something else that I'll tell you on another day. But it's all about how we make our gardens so beautiful and take care of the areas around our chapel they really have never looked better. I, I can't imagine them. They're, they're just... <laughs> and so we're taking it to another level by recognizing certain individuals on the green team who exceed all expectations and bless all of us with their diligence and how they take care of parts of our garden. There is one part of the garden that is especially... Uh, noteworthy today. And so we're going to have, I don't know if it's going to be an annual award or a semi-annual award, but we're giving it out today and it's the very first inaugural award, the Green Team Award, uh, to a couple who has given so much to help beautify our grounds. And this morning we want to present this award to Joan and Frosty Mitchell. Joan and Frosty, on behalf of the Mariner Sands Chapel, we present you this certificate of appreciation for your outstanding work on the green team. And in addition to that certificate, which you may proudly display on your love me wall at home, uh, <laughs> next to your pictures of, along with the president and all their great people, you'll have the Mariner Sands certificate. We're also going to place out in our garden by the Romeliads after our service today, the Joan and Frosty Mitchell Garden. And so after our service today, if you will join me. Yeah, please. <laughs> after our service today, I'm going to walk out with, with Judith and with Tony, and I want all of you else as well, if, as you can, join me out in the area where the bromeliads are, and we're going to place this lovely sign, the 2024 Joan and Frosty Mitchell Garden. Thank you so much. I think we're going to take the cake before the service and go out and clean it up. <laughs> Joan says, well, before the service, we're going to go out and clean it up. <laughs> Oh, 
hold that one. No, thank you. And now, uh, as we usually do with the beginning, I don't know if it's annoying or not, but it's, uh, it's just a way that we mark our time of fellowship with one another and the transition into worship. Uh, we ring a bell, and a bell is simply a, something to get your attention. Someday, maybe I'll have someone who is here every week who will blow the trumpet, and at the last trumpet, we'll all stand but in worship. But today, we use a mariner's bell, and we ring three bells to mark 9.30 a.m. Let us stand together. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth are salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. And so let's sing number 284. I will sing the wonder story. Remain standing as we sing.
Pray with me together this prayer of confession. O oh Lord, I marvel that you pur purpose to become flesh so that you might be crucified, dead, and buried for me. The tomb calls forth my adoring wonder, for it is empty and you are risen. Grant me to die with you that I may rise to new life, for I wish to be as dead and buried to sin, to selfishness, to the world, that I might not hear the voice of the charmer and be delivered by his host. Purge me from selfishness, pride, and fear of man. Grant me to stand with my Savior, content to be rejected, willing to hold to unpopular truths. Grant me more of the resurrection life. May it rule me. May I walk in its power and be strengthened through its influence. Amen. Turn to one another and pass the peace that we have in Jesus Christ. As forgiven and reconciled people, share that peace. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the Book of Psalms. You can follow along on page 773 of your pew Bible, if you care to. Answer me when I call to you, righteous God. Give me relief for my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you prepare you people turn my glory into shame. How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble, do not sin. When you are in your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, made me dwell in safe. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> hymn number 318 is a hymn of comfort and assurance, a prayer perhaps for all of us as we ask God to help us still our souls. Be still my soul. Number 318. Congregation be seated. Five stand. <laughs>
Our New Testament reading, you will find on page 1858 in your Pew Bible. See what the great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be, he has not yet been. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone whose sins break the law, in fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away all sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who comes, what is right is righteousness, just as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord.
As we go to prayer today, let's be mindful of all the tragic world events going on. Uh, I understand from the news that, again, there's more distress and missiles being fired into Israel. And it causes world leaders to pause and reflect on what could be done, what should be done, what ought to be done, what are the good things to do, what are evil things to do. So let's also pray for our world leaders as they try to discern how to bring peace. Let's pray together. Today, O oh Lord God, you watch every country in the world. You watch over every state in our country. You watch over every city in the world, every village in the world. You even watch over every home. There is there is simply not a satellite that has ever been invented that can see as deeply and as clearly as your holy vision. You see what goes on in each of our lives. And as we have said already, we confess our sins before you. We want to intercede on behalf of the sins of others, those who mean destruction for their neighbors and for their fellow citizens. Almighty God, would you thwart the schemes of the evil one and promote leaders who will establish peace in our world. We pray for peace in Israel. We pray for peace in the Ukraine. We pray for peace in the Sudan in parts of Southeast Asia. We pray for peace along our southern border. We also, God, pray for peace sometimes with, within our own families. When father and mother and child, grandchild, they bicker over things that seem so senseless. Help us, oh God, to get an eternal perspective on all these things, understanding that our world is broken, but that you have come to redeem our brokenness and give us true peace, not only the peace, the feeling of peace, but actually establishing a relationship of peace with you and with each other. Oh Lord God, as we read in our New Testament today, your great love has been lavished upon us and we are your children, and so we cry out to you, Heavenly Father, to bring restoration to our broken world. Help those who have hope, who need your hope today. Provide for them their shelter, be their safety. May they too, like we read in the Psalms, may they be able to rest at night in peaceful sleep knowing that you guard them and protect them in safety. Almighty God, we also think about those who have broken the law and those who live in lawlessness. We pray, Almighty God, that you will help justice to reign in those areas so that those who do break the law will understand the dimension of what their actions are. The, the impact their actions have on all of us and the cost that it takes. So God, we ask for peace. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and lead, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the kingdom. Let's just reflect a moment on that last passage, that last phrase. Thine is the kingdom, his is the real kingdom. His is the real power, and his, to him, is all the glory. May what is done in heaven every day be done here on earth, we pray. Amen.
our ushers will come forward and we'll receive our regular offerings, our gifts of God, gifts to God from our wealth, from our talents, and from our time. So, Almighty God, we give you these gifts. We know that even a small amount given in love can be magnified a hundredfold to be used for your kingdom's work. We ask, Almighty God, that these gifts be used for your work, for your glory, for your service to restore, redeem, and provide evangelistic good news to our community and our world. We lay these at your altar. Bless these gifts of ours, of both our time and our treasure and our talents. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our gospel reading today comes from the 24th chapter of Luke. We're in the passage and the time of the Christian season where these are the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. We are in verses 36 to 48. It's on page 1,611 in the Bible there in your seat ahead of you. Hear God's word. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. 
And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, anyone have something here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all generations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And I'm going to send you what my father has promised but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, the word of God for the people of God. So we're in this post-resurrection period, and last week I talked about the Emmaus Road disciples and uh, wonderful conversations that we had throughout the week as a result of that with others as we were thinking about this passage. And now Jesus, as the disciples, the two disciples from Emmaus, Emmaus walked that Sunday evening back seven miles to Jerusalem, they're now within a little enclosed area behind locked doors and they are gathered together and the two disciples are telling them what happened and Jesus then appears in their midst and they're shaken they're startled they don't quite recognize him ever gone to a 50th high school reunion uh People don't recognize you, and sometimes you like to go anonymously saying, no, I'm just married to someone who graduated. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just looking around. <laughs> and, uh, but then every now and then you'll hear someone's voice or you'll see that twinkle in their eye, and you say, oh, yeah, you were a cheerleader, weren't you? Or you were a football player, weren't you? Oh, I remember that game when you sank the basket. And while they don't look anything like that person, Somehow, in the chemistry of the moment, you recognize, wow, this is, this is that guy. This is that gal. We're very concerned about our bodies. If you go to a drugstore uh, or a supermarket, you go to the magazine aisles, I'd say, I'm just guessing, but eight out of ten of those magazines on those shelves have something to do with, uh, with your appearance, making you look pretty, making you look younger, making you look lighter uh, so that you can have, eat the right food and exercise so that you can somehow magically, irrationally become like the person on that cover of a magazine. I don't know why we do it, but we spend millions of dollars on products to get us back into physical shape or to fix us up or to paint us up or to clean us up. We're just overwhelmed with this obsession of our outside bodies. It's okay. I'm not putting any guilt on you. I'm the same way. I look in the mirror and I say, well, there's a lot of room for improvement, God. <laughs> but, but for the Christian, there is another dimension to your image your attitude and your image. When you become a believer, something happens on the inside. Something is triggered in your soul that changes from a life of just this world to something that becomes everlasting. And what is in you, what we call the soul, is somehow awakened to the presence of God and then as we continue to follow Jesus and read the scriptures and grow in our Christian life and mature as 
followers of Jesus, we become more and more in our character, in our spirit, in our souls. We become more and more godly. Would you agree? Anybody disagree here? Okay. So there we go. Now I want you to think about something that you've seen while you're on a tourist trip. Have you ever seen those little Russian dolls that are called uh, matryoshka dolls? Or uh, Matryoshka is a Russian word that means nesting dolls. You've probably heard of them as babushka dolls. But babushka means old woman. I don't like to use that term, so we'll use matryoshka. Uh, these dolls are such that they, you take the top part of the doll off, and there is another doll exactly like it that's a little smaller on the inside, right? So I have been thinking about that this week, and I thought, well, what kind of body did Jesus have? What, what was it like? after he resurrected from the dead because it shows that he really did some amazing things. He was able to go from Emmaus at a dinner table with two disciples and while they run back to Jerusalem seven miles, he flies and he's there in a moment's notice. He is able to go through walls. That's weird. He is able to enter into locked areas, locked doors. It shows that as he's with them and they're startled, they don't quite recognize him, but as he talks with them and as he shows them his hands, his feet, in John we read from Tom, where Thomas experiences, he actually puts his hand in the side where the spear pierces Jesus' side. We see that after Jesus resurrects from the dead, he's given a body, it says he has flesh and bones, so you, it's not a ghost, it's a, it's a real body, and you can recognize the voice, the attitude, the character. You just kind of know, hey, this is the real guy. We also notice from this passage that he says, hey, I'm hungry, you got anything to eat? And so, I don't know, somewhere under the table they bring out a, you know, a mick fish and uh, they, they serve it to him. And he eats broiled fish in their presence. So he's able to eat with this new body. As he's talking with them, he gives them something else. He says, I'm going to say, peace be with you. And then it says in verse 45, he opened their minds to the scriptures. And that's something else that happens with this new body. Your, your mind is enlightened to the new understanding of how all these things work. There is something inside your babushka doll world that is just like you, but you can't see it right now because you're in this world. The body that you have been given is designed to live in this world. So when you are hungry, when you have cravings, when you have addictions, these are all the things that happen in this world. But as you are in the next world, you can eat, you can sing, you can run, you can fly, you can do all these things without this addiction or craving feeling. As you look at your hands, oh, don't look at your hands. We don't want to look at our hands. But you see that... The skin gets old as, as time continues on. In the next world, it doesn't. Our bodies are totally transformed. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about this new body. Do you remember in 2 Corinthians where he says these words? We know that if the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God an eternal house in the heavens, not built by human hands. Now, you all know what a tent is, right? I really was thinking earlier about Tuesday as I was tinkering around with this message. I thought about setting up a tent right here, and I thought, no, that's too kitschy. That, I, we, don't, we don't need to. Just imagine a tent. Imagine a tent that it's kind of it's flimsy. It's, it's, you can touch it, but you know you could live in it. You could camp in it overnight, but... You really wouldn't want to like live in it forever, would you? I mean, it's just, it's a temporary dwelling. Paul says 
when we are in this world, we're like living in a tent. Our body is fragile. It's temporary. But yet, God has prepared us something that is solid, that is lasting forever, a building from God, it says, eternal in the heavens, and it's not made by human hands. That is your new resurrected body. We groan being clothed it says we groan in this tent-like temporary body because we don't want to be found naked, but we instead, while we're in this tent, we groan being burdened because we wish to be clothed with a heavenly dwelling. And the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given his Holy Spirit as a deposit. What's a deposit? You all know what a deposit is. It's a it's it's a down payment. It's something that is given to you. It's not the whole deal. It's not the full payment. It's simply a deposit. God has given you a deposit in your soul so you know kind of what's coming up, but not really. You just have a promise of what's coming. He has given you the deposit of his Holy Spirit, but when we die and we have a new resurrected body, you become not only a child of God, but an heir. And what happens to someone who is an heir? Any lawyers in here? To be an heir at the reading of the will, someone's got to die, right? And when the heir is announced, who gets what the dead guy promised? The heir gets everything, right? Jesus died for us. We are his children. When he has resurrected, he says, and now I give you the whole load. So while we know in part we will at one point be like him, as 1 John says. When we see him, we will see him as he really is because we will bear his full image. Do you remember in the Old Testament when God was telling the people of Israel, hey, I want you to come out and worship, and here's what I want you to set up for worship. It was called a uh, drum roll. What was it called? A tabernacle, right? A tabernacle was a tent. It was a mobile thing for worship. It, it was everything God provided for people in that time until something more permanent could be developed. And so the tabernacle was a place of worship. God dwelt in the tabernacle. But then as the people became more mature, more organized, God didn't really want them to build a temple, but they did anyway. And he says, well, if you're going to do it anyway and you're going to have a king, do it this way. And so it's a very ornate experience of building this temple. The temple was nothing like the tabernacle in terms of its makeup, but its design had the same features. So when a priest went into the Holy of Holies, it literally felt like this is the same Holy of Holies as it was in the tabernacle. The temple was the permanent version of a tabernacle. In the same way, your soul body is a temporary tabernacle, which will eventually get a brand new temple, a building not made with hands that is eternal. Yeah, let's see, that's something to think about, isn't it? Paul says, therefore know this, that while we're at home in this body, we're absent, we're away from the Lord. And we live by faith, not by sight. You know, that's, when I'm having a bad morning, I love that verse. I should memorize that verse when I look in the mirror. You know what, Gary? I live by faith and not by sight. What you see is just a glimpse of the glory that is to be. The beauty and the glory of the heavenly body is of one kind, it says in 1 Corinthians 15. But the body that we are going to receive is of a different kind. In Philippians 3, chapter, or chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, it says that we will be like the body of his glory. It will be a glorious body. And so everything that you see now is, is good, but not yet glorious. It's going to be like that. That's what Paul says. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, there's a passage where it talks about while our outer body is wasting away and decaying, yet our inner body, our inner soul, our, our, our self is being renewed day by day. For this momentary light affliction that we experience each day is producing us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, which is the outside stuff, but the things which are inside, the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So this is a small Bible study about our new bodies. We have funerals, memorial services, celebrations of life, and when someone dies, family members wonder, well, well, what happens to this person? And so I wanted to address that today. Yesterday, the family of Don and Eleanor Corsig, we had a memorial burial service yesterday for them. The family was there. Those of you who knew Don Corsig, a dentist, a prominent dentist here, and just a lovely family. All the kids were here. And as I looked at Ken and Renee and Alan and, and, uh, and uh, Kent, I could see in their faces what their mom and dad looked like. Because I remember Don. He was here in 2019, 2020. They really acted and looked a lot like their mom and dad. There's something about us that makes us a lot like our parents. And as believers, there's something about us that makes us a lot like our Heavenly Father. There's something great in us. This body is perishable. Another passage in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, Paul talks about this perishable body. And he talks about it being sown and then resurrected as imperishable. Imagine those of you who like gardening, and I know there are at least two here that like gardening, and maybe more. When you plant a seed in the ground, it is simply a seed. It doesn't look anything like it's supposed to. But if you could talk to the seed, the seed would say, I know who I am. I know what I'm going to become. All the beauty that you can't see in me is bound up inside the seed until I am planted in the ground and I then grow into something lovely. We take that seed and we do the worst thing possible. We put it in dirt. We bury it. We water it. And we just wait. And the seed has no idea what's coming out, except for some reason it busts out of its shell, like a caterpillar coming out of a chrysalis. The seed busts out and it starts reaching for something, although it's dirt all around. Eventually, it finds its way to the sky. And it says, ah, and now it grows. It grows and grows and becomes a flower. It becomes a plant. It becomes a vegetable or a fruit or a great tree. And you look and you scratch your head and say, all that was in that seed? All of that was in that seed? And I'd say, we should all scratch our heads as we look at one another and we say, all that glory is in your body? All of that is in you? We don't know what it's going to be like, as 1 John says. We just don't know how it happens or when it happens, but we know one thing. We know something very important, that when we see him, we shall be like him. And we shall see him for who he really is. We will look kind of different. We will look kind of like, uh, it'll be the opposite effect of a 50th year reunion. Imagine Everything backwards. You go to high school as an old person, and when you meet for, the, meet for the 50th year afterwards, you're 18 years old, and you're ready to buy a motorcycle <laughs> and live risky lives and eat all kinds of food because you have no worries about you're going to gain weight or, or anything like that. You just have joy, and that's what awaits all of us. You can lie down in peace knowing that God has taken care of you forever. That is a great promise. We don't follow Jesus to be nice people in this world. 
We follow Jesus so that he can become our heavenly father, so that we can be an heir to what he has awaiting for us. We can be at peace and sleep at peace knowing that when this body gets wrinkly, when it starts breaking down, we are getting closer and closer to the day when everything will be new. And I'm totally confident that when we die, we shall really be like him. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit lives in you. God is going to totally take care of you forever. And when we get there in glory, you will see wonderful things. You will live forever. Any other religions tell you that? Is there any positive thinkers that can ma match that kind of good news? To be a part of this glorious plan that God has, all it takes is doing the simplest thing that every human being can do. You simply talk to God, have an honesty moment, and you say, Holy God, I choose to have your spirit not only in my body, but to reign in me, to be the king of my life, so that when I die as your child in this world, I feel and experience the great resurrection. And while I don't look anything like you now, and I don't even know what you look like when I die, I will be like your child. I'll be the spitting image of you, and I will see you as you really are. What great care God has done in creating a wonderful, unique design of our bodies to make it a lot like the inner body that is yet to be revealed. So as I see you all at the end of our service and throughout the week, I'm looking at your outer babushka. But I know there is an inner babushka that is glorious and yet to be revealed. And together, we will be in eternity in God's great kingdom. Amen. Sing with me, please, number 250, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord, grace that is greater than all our sin. Stand, please, as we sing.
grace, grace. It is by grace you have been saved by faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all this week. May we look at one another as true believers, brothers and sisters in the faith who have something wonderful buried within. May what you have within be let out and unleashed and used and live that resurrected life this week. God bless you today. Frosty and Joan, will you join me at the leading of the, of the procession out? And uh, Karen, will as well, will you join me? And we'll go out to the garden. Thank you.